So this is lecture three on Flannery O'Connor's Wise Blood. Uh, we left off chapter six, um, and uh, the the scene was um, the the um, Hazel notes reading the description of um, of uh, Hazel Hawks's failed blinding of himself, um, and it leads to uh, Hazel at the end of chapter six, um, trying to get his car fixed because it's you know he, he he bought a disaster of a car, a car's falling apart. He takes it to a mechanic. Uh, he wants a couple of things done. The mechanic is, says this is car's garbage, can't be done. Um, the mechanic asks him if he's going someplace, and he goes to another mechanic. Uh, and he takes it to another mechanic who who lies to him, tells him he can be fixed. Um, Hazel, Hazel, man, um, the last, the last lines are, um, Hayes left it with him certain that it was in honest hands. Of course, it's in dishonest hands. This car is falling apart. He's, the guy's probably going to do nothing to it and charge him, charge him an exorbitant amount of money. So the next day, um, begins with chapter seven um, and Hazel um, we see Hazel um, um, driving out into the country with um, Sabbath Hawks um, remember the image of of the car the car is a representation of some sort of false freedom um, let's see if I can find this passage he thinks of it as a as a place. This is on page one ten. Uh, as a place uh, that I'm always away in. Um, so that the, the sense of escape, of freedom, right? The sense of the, the idea of freedom, by the way, is interesting. Um, freedom from something or freedom to something. Hayes has no idea what he's running to. Um, it's always a, an escape, um, fr freedom from, and again, he can't escape himself. Uh, that's what we're going to, that's what he's going to discover, right? This, this sense that we take ourselves with ourselves everywhere we go. And um, that's the place where, where real change takes place. So <clears throat> Hazel drives his car in the country. Uh Lily, Sabbath Lily Hawks is hidden in the back. Um, and uh, the dialogue here is, is interesting. Um, Sabbath is filled with a kind of sense of self-loathing. You get the sense of, of somebody. She's a bastard child, right? Um, which means she was born out of wedlock. Uh Hazel doesn't understand how she can possibly a preacher can possibly um, have a bastard child. His naivete, right, his sense that if you're a child, a man, a man of, of of God, you won't sin, um, is built into his mindset. He doesn't understand hypocrisy, or maybe it's not even just hypocrisy; it's just weakness. Um, remember, the taxi driver said something true. You know, no matter who it is, you're a human being. You can't escape. Uh, you're not. You're not better. Nobody's better than anybody else. Uh, Hazel. Hazel can't can't comprehend this. Um, so um, Sabbath. Uh, Sabbath's discussion of herself again is one of, of of a kind of resignation or acceptance of her own of her own. Um, of her own, um, hard to say, her own neglect, right? The fact, her own rejection, right? She's been rejected. Um, so, <clears throat> so the rejection, um, you know, there's ways of dealing with that. One is to just sort of sweep it to the side. She's kind of accepted all this. She's jaded. She's corrupted, uh, as frequently the case. Um, when one is lonely or rejected, one turns to, to 
to sexual to sexual relations to to get affirmation, um, and um, this comes out in this in this. She writes a letter. This Mary Brittle, um, who's a who, who's a psychologist. There's these, you know, we still have Dear Abby. We still have these these newspaper columns where where people um. People write in for advice, and these advice columns are, you know, who knows, um, you know, filled with psycho babble and and um, and Mary Brittle. She says, you know, what about sexuality? She said, you need, you know, Mary's advice is 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 to get adjusted to the modern world. And Sabbath Sabbath's response is, I am adjusted. I'm quite well adjusted to the modern world. Um, and she. Um, she, um, it, it, it filled with, again, this psycho babble of, of, um, um, of, of coming to, coming to accept oneself, um, no matter what. Well, you know, as Jean-Paul Sartre said, you know, honesty is honesty, you know, oh yeah, yeah, sure. I'm a murderer. <laughs> you know, I, I, you can be honest. I'm a murderer. Get used to it. Right. Well, that goes all the way down the line. Right. Um, so, so to adjust, she's, she's, she's quite happy with herself. Right? Uh, she is a kind of, she, she's wallowing in her own, her own, um, her own misery. And of course, you know, what, 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 is, what else is there to do? Um, she's neglected. She has no support. Um, where is she going to turn? Uh, so this, she's going to she's going to console herself, uh, however way she can. Um, so this scene is humorous, uh, and, but but also really revealing and painful. Um, you know, Hayes wants to corrupt her, but she's trying to seduce him. So so it's it's absurd, right? Hayes is the Hayes is really. In over his head, he's out of his depth. Um, th this is a this is the, the irony of the scene of the two working at odds, um, and the the countryside here is used in a very interesting way uh, because it it releases them from from the from the urban setting and places them in a country setting which is natural. And open and in some ways liberating and freeing. And they can be themselves. There's this quality to this scene that's quite interesting. And romantic, right? It's 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 two lovers on a picnic, you know, out in the country. And and um and so the 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 imagery here I think uh is is of of um, Flannery O'Connor, I think, is thinking of Par Milton's Paradise Lost again. Hazel is is the de is the Satan trying to corrupt the innocent Eve. Um, the irony, of course, is that Eve is an innocent. Um, she's already been wholly corrupted, and is quite happy to be. So. Um, the, the dialogue here um, is is surprisingly tender. She she puts herself as as a kind of Jesus figure, a savior. I can save you, she says. I got a church in my heart where Jesus is king. It's mocking, but somewhat honest, right? Um, she, she has a place in her heart, right? A church, a place that, that, um, and the, where Jesus is king is an odd thing. It's hard to know what she's thinking there. Um, you know, is, is she being serious there? Maybe, maybe, you know, with love, where love is king, perhaps, um, in her own twisted, confused, lonely way of thinking about things. 
And he says, I believe in a new kind of Jesus. By the way, J Jesus with a lowercase j. This is at 19. One that can't waste his blood redeeming people with it because he's all man and ain't got any God in him. My church is a church without Christ. Um, so, uh, flat, all flattened out. No, no divinity and no sin. Can a bastard be saved in it, she asked. There is no such thing as a bastard in the church without Christ. Everything is all one. A bastard wouldn't be any different from anybody else. That's good, she said. Now, what's interesting and ironic about this is that Hazel is describing a church that he's never come into contact with, but which, which actually is the true representation of Christianity, where everybody is the same. So he's lighted upon the answer. Um, but, but that's the answer that a, a, a Christian who gets Christianity, right, and some of its essential teachings, would say. Um, so she, Sabbath, is happy with this because, you know, this idea of being a bastard, that's, that's not her fault. But, of course, it's not just the branding. That, that's not really the problem. The problem is she has no mother. And she has a neglectful father. So she's got no love and no support. So it's really not the label bastard, but the, but the damage that's done through, through neglect and abuse that Sabbath has to live with. Um, and she's attracted to this Hazel Moats figure who, who has got deep, deep problems and really doesn't love her at all. So um, she had earlier said, I shall not enter the kingdom of heaven anyway, so I don't understand what difference it makes. Right? So if she's, if she's damned, uh, she's going to just go ahead and get whatever she can, whatever she can out of life. She's not gone so far as Hazel. Right? She's basically not thinking through this and, oh, you know, if I'm damned, what does it matter? Um, so he's he's deeper than her, and but but her her own sense of her own desires is perhaps more pure than Hazel's. Um, and there's a dialogue here that shows her vulnerability. Um, she says, they're, they're talking about this church without Christ. On page 121, she says, why don't you lie down and rest yourselves? Hayes moved a few feet away and lay down. He put his hat over his face and folded his arms across his chest. She lifted herself up on her hands and knees and crawled over to him and gazed at the top of his hat. Then she lifted it off like a lid and peered into his eyes. They stared straight upward. This is heartbreaking. Oh, that's my comment. <laughs> it's heartbreaking. I've, I've been reading, but this is my interjection. Here's what she says to him. It don't make any difference to me, she said softly, how much you like me. Um, she, she wants to love, she wants to love somebody, uh, she wants to not be lonely, right, so it doesn't matter to her. He trained his eyes into her neck. Gradually, she lowered her head until the tips of their noses almost touched, but still he didn't look at her. She's looking, he's looking somewhere else and she's trying to look into his eyes. This is, this is tender and beautiful. By the way, keep this in mind because the, the last scene will be Mrs. Flood looking into Hazel Motes' eyes. Uh, he's already, de he's dead. So that pattern, right, of a live girl looking for love, looking into his eyes, looking into, to try to find him. 
right? To try to see him and try to get him to see her. This is a beautiful, remarkable scene about tenderness and a desire for connection. I see you, she said in a playful voice. She's a child, but you can see the amorousness of this. This would be a, I could see a, I could see an adult woman playing like this, being playful like this. Get away, he said, jumping violently. The, set, the idea of intimacy does not connect with him. She scrambled up and ran around behind the tree. Hayes put his hat back on and stood up, shaken. He wanted to get back in the Essex. He realized suddenly that it was parked on a country road, unlocked, and that the first person passing by would drive off in it. I see you, a voice said from behind the tree. He walked off quickly in the opposite direction toward the car, a jubilant expression on the face that looked from around the tree flattened. Right, the, trying to catch his attention. Um, so, um, they, they're, they head off, right? Um, and, um, you know, um, this, this crazy, um, uh, scene ends with them, you know, encountering all kinds of weird road stands, you know, um, you know, you can watch bears fighting and fighting with their enemies. And, um, you know, you, you can see them now still, you know, Florida's biggest alligator. You can stop at roads. Everybody's, everybody's got the biggest alligator in, in Florida, right? They're at a road, some roadside stand. Um, so this is a sad, a sad scene. Hazel really in trouble of, of connection. Um, Sabbath attempting attempting to, to find some this romantic scene broken apart by by brokenness um, so um, this this chapter ends with Hazel confronting a one-armed man um, who helps him without being paid and Hazel's disdain for him, his claim that he needs no help, of course he does, uh, is a symbol, is a is symbolic of, of Hazel's, first of all, it's given by a man who, is, who himself is wounded and broken physically, but seems to be intact psychologically and internally, subjectively, consciously, spiritually. Charity. Right, Hazel can't accept it uh, because it it would he would have to acknowledge his own dependence. Uh, he does not want to acknowledge his dependence. Why? Why? Why would why would that be? Well, because um, when you've been let down by so many people, uh, you don't want to be let down again. So, what's the way to what's the way to protect yourself against that by by claiming a false sense of security by building up walls by building up screens so we see that that Hayes here has um we, we see the reason for this in this this scene that seems not to be part of the story but really is part of the story right it's a it's an insight into Hazel and his the the, the the walls he's built up so that he does not have to um, does not have to acknowledge dependence, so he does not have to um, be let down, be hurt um, again. This is the this is the key element in it, in chapter seven. It's a brilliant, uh, brilliantly wrought, uh, remarkably um, uh, dramatized uh, scene. Of psychic debility, and and uh, the, the the problems of the problems of, of neglect, um, the problems of, of childhood uh, neglect and abuse that gets worked out into dysfunction, into dysfunction and conflict, right? 
Uh, there is something wrong here with this scene. There's something deeply wrong in many, many ways. Uh, and and um, the, the comedy is meant, as, as she points out in her, in her preface, uh, the comedy is meant to point to something really serious. Everybody wants to be loved. Um, but, but debilities, uh, especially at, at a young age, uh, create all kinds of problems there. Um, so, um, we turn then to Enoch Emery's room in chapter eight. Uh, there are two pictures. There's a, three pictures. There's, remember, he's renting this, so they, these pictures happen to be there. There's a moose, a picture of a moose which he hates. He, and it's a long description of this, pages 132 to 134. His hatred of the moose, why? Why? Well, in, Hayes, in Enoch's sort of subhuman, maybe not subhuman, but bestial driven mind, right? But his animalistic urges. Um, you know, the moose is self contained, the moose is self satisfied, the moose can't help but being a moose. Its nature is to be a moose, and it's going to be a moose no matter what. Human beings, because of that, we're, we're conscious. We're, we're bodies like we have animal, we're the animal bodies we share with the animals in that. But we have self-reflection. We have the ability to reflect. And that self-reflection creates a division in us. Um, that needs to reconnect with the body or can dissociate with the body. Hey, hey and Enoch are dissociated from the body, right? Um, so, so to recognize the moose and to hate it, and it's, it's subconscious, right? It's not a conscious hatred. He doesn't know why. So remember what Flannery O'Connor said, we're not given vital information at key points. And we have to think our way through. This is one of those moments where we have to think. You know, why does he hate the moose? Well, because his blood isn't very wise. He hasn't assimilated his body into his thinking. And so, so he's, there's, there, there's a division there. Uh, and so, so Flannery O'Connor does suggest that she says that Enoch's blood made him do things he didn't want to and that are always dangerous. Right. That, again, I, I pointed out in the last lecture, St. Paul's claim, right? The, the good that I wish to do, I don't do. The evil that I don't wish to do, I do. Right? This is a saint talking. So um, human beings are divided in themselves. The things they want to do, they're not free. Uh, they're not free. The things they wish to do, they fail at. Um, and, and this is a terrible predicament for human nature. Sorry to say. Um, and Enoch is Enoch and and Hazel are 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 sort of extreme representations of this, but are continuous with all of human existence. Um, so, again, his blood, his instincts, his body drives him to things that hurt him. And, and really, that's the problem that you know, one has to recognize here about, about uh, a sin for Christianity. It's not this evil, you bad, bad person. Uh, it, it's, it's the sense that we damage ourselves and we hurt ourselves, not just physically, but we damage our, our, our loves, our happiness, um, and again, one can see the continuation of the Oedipus theme here. Um, you know, uh, just a sidelight, the, the, there's a, a great uh, um, Catholic writer named Thomas Merton, who was a monk, actually, um, who wrote a lot of spiritual books in the 50s and 60s. Seven Story Mountain is one of the cl it's classics. It's a classic book. Um, uh, he he read Wise Blood 
and said that um, that um, Flannery O'Connor is the new Sophocles, the modern Sophocles. This this book is as great as as Oedipus of Tyrannus. So an interesting point, just a sidelight. Um, so um, Hazel's preaching here. Uh, we move from Enoch's room out into the open. Hazel's preaching. Um, you know, it's getting more violent and 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 more strident. There is no peace for the redeemed, he shouted. And I preach peace. I preach the church without Christ, the church peaceful and satisfied. Well, if he's so satisfied, why is he preaching it? Right? It's 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 become an obsession. Um and so Hazel's offended by people turn away, claims they don't care for the truth. Deadly serious, right? This, 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 his atheism is, is got a religious zeal to it, right? Um, so that he, the, the idea that we need a new Jesus now, that's the new thought. I need a new Jesus to replace the old Jesus. What can I do? I need a symbol. He needs a symbol. He needs a, some sort of image. Um, and he says it's got to be one that's all man without blood to waste and needs one that don't look like any other man so you'll look at him so um, a weird sort of um, again uh, a man with all man without blood to waste without blood to waste um, so again, what is that? Something, something perhaps even dead, a man who's dead, um, or the, without blood to waste, right? The, remember the, the wise blood here, this comes in, maybe blood, it, it's wise not to shed your blood <clears throat> for someone else, right? That's the wisdom of, of, of Christ uncrucified right christ the church of christ the peaceful he doesn't shed his blood for anybody why should anybody shed anybody's blood for anybody um so no blood to waste and it needs one that don't look like any other man so you'll look at him so some something that's distorted a man who doesn't shed blood for anybody but it doesn't look like a man um, and this new Jesus will save. How? From what? It will save people from having to be saved. <laughs> That's the brilliance of Hazel Moats' drive to get rid of Christ. Right? The, the need to be saved has to be banished to gain some sort of psychological help. The tension is too great to acknowledge one's own dependence, uh, one's own weaknesses, one's own propensity to damage oneself, uh, one's ability to hurt other people. One's pain that one receives from other people, because that really can't be controlled in many ways. So how do we get rid of this pain of suffering, that's of damage. That's really the key here. So the novel takes on a really comic turn here. And again, um, I grew up with watching these fake preachers. I've seen many fake preachers before, um, but we 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 run into Hazel's confrontation with. With Oni J. Holy. Oni J. Holy. Get it? Only J is holy. Oni J. Holy. Um, and uh, he's a charlatan. He's a he's a he's a he's a snake oil salesman, right? Um, he's a sidewalk preacher preaching a preaching a uh, a very placid view of 
human nature. O'Connor writes about this in, in other lectures and in, 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 in other essays. Um, here's his view of human nature. Human beings are born sweet, and but life corrupts him. True. So, so um, it's lack of love um, causes people to act the way they do. True, he's right. But he announces a new church, the Holy Church of Christ without Christ. Um, notice that. It adds Christ without Christ, so it's a, it's different from, from Hazel Moats's uh, church. Obviously, Oni J. Holy is 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 sees a scam, and sees a way into the scam, um, and uh, has learned something from Hazel. How to make a buck? Hazel doesn't want to make a buck off of it. Oni J. Holy does. So here are the principles. Accept only what you understand. You build on your own interpretation of the Bible. It's up to date and progressive. It's based on the psychology of affirmation. This was a pop psychology in the 50s. And it became wedded with Christianity in many ways. So, so just, you know, you're already redeemed. It's already been done. Don't worry about it. the Church of Christ without Christ, right? Um, and uh, just you know, be happy. Just be happy. Forget about it. Um, and Hazel recognizes the falseness of this. Why? Because he rec he at least recognizes that that the pain is real. The suffering is real. And to deny it. Is a is a is a deep form of hypocrisy. Um, so, um, so Hazel becomes upset by this, really angered by this. Uh, again, his integrity. What's his integrity? His integrity is, you know, he's not going to accept um, any fall, any halfway solutions. It's either no Christ or 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 Christ, one or the other. Uh, and, and again, trying to get to that point where you can feel comfortable without Christ. This leads into the end of chapter, no, chapter 9 with this disturbing scene in which Hazel discovers um, that Asa Hawks really is not blind. He really wants to know. Um, you know, he's, he's read the newspaper reports, but he's, he's interested in knowing. Um, so remember they're staying in the same boarding house um, and he's sleeping in the day I'll read the whole passage you know O'Connor's writing is remarkable um, what's interesting if you look at it it's very unusual um, I haven't looked, uh, looked at her style yet but this is a point to look at the style if you look at the page in the essays and the novel, there's very few commas. This is an unusual style of writing because it's extremely straightforward and bare bones and um, but at the same time um, subtly complex. Her sentences are not simple sentences. Um, they're deceptively simple. So she's a really unusual writer. The style of writing without the com without commas, but it, it, it's it's a remarkable, angular, straightforward approach that's immediate and concrete and clear. And 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 the clarity of that reveals a kind of depth. It's like looking into a clear lake. A really clear lake on a really clear day, and and thinking you should see the bottom, but you can't. You have no idea the depth. Um, that's the brilliance of her writing. It's a remarkable, remarkable style, really unusual again. So let me just read this, and you can get the sense of the of the way she paints a picture. 
but the suggestiveness of it, right? What is going on be, be, behind Asa Hawks's, yeah, inside Asa Hawks and inside Hazel, um, we catch these glimpses and we're made to try to really reflect and think about it. So let me just read the passages. Brilliant, brilliant passage with, that really illustrates the, that, the way the appearance points to a deeper reality. This is on 162. Finally, he shook off the dream and woke up. He thought it should be morning, but it was only midnight. He pulled himself over into the front of the car and eased his foot on the starter, and the Essex rolled off quietly as if nothing were the matter with it. He drove back to the house and let himself in, but instead of going upstairs to his room, he stood in the hall looking at the blind man's door. He went over to it and put his ear to the keyhole and heard the sound of snoring. He turned the knob gently, but the door didn't move. For the first time, the idea of picking the lock occurred to him. He felt in his pockets for an instrument and came on a small piece of wire that he sometimes used for a toothpick. There was only a dim light in the hall, but it was enough for him to work by, and he knelt down at the keyhole and inserted the wire into, into it carefully, trying not to make a noise. After a while, when he had tried the wire five or six different ways, there was a slight click in the lock. He stood up trembling and opened the door. His breath came short and his heart was palpitating, as if he had run all the way here from a great distance. He stood just inside the room until his eyes got accustomed to the darkness, and then he moved slowly over to the iron bed and stood there. Hawks was lying across it. His head was hanging over the edge. Hayes squatted down by him and struck a match close to his face, and he opened his eyes. The two sets of eyes looked at each other as long as the match lasted. There's another scene, right, which finally people look eye to eye. Hayes' expression seemed to open up, open onto a deeper blankness and reflect something and then close again. Now you can get out, Hawks said in a short, thick voice. Now you can leave me alone. And he made a jab at the face over him without touching it. It moved back, expressionless, under the white hat and was gone in a second. Again, these moments where people look into each other's eyes are startling because no one ever looks into each other's eyes except in these moments of real revelation where their real weakness, their emptiness, uh, comes into play and is seen by another uh, um, is, is, is the attempt to, to plumb those depths, right? Um, these, are, these are moments of true um, profundity. And again, um, the, the attempt to understand each other in this is really a, 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 a hallmark of, of, um, of these profound moments. So again, there's another one at the end where, hey, where Mrs. Flood, uh, we'll see at the end, looking into, into Hazel Motes' um, dead eyes. It's always emptiness one sees, always a sense of emptiness um, and, and the shock of that. Um, so um, I write about this in other short stories, but it's in all of them, the moment of blankness, of emptiness. That emptiness, how did one fill that emptiness of the soul? That hunger, that need uh, for love and affirmation um, and acceptance of one's being, right? These are moments where O'Connor highlights that. And why does she show it? She shows it to show the lack, to show the lack. It's, it's really the, a negative image that she's presenting. She never explains how it's filled. In these in these novels and short stories. Um, all right, I'm going to stop there, and uh, I'll I'll have another final lecture to conclude Flannery O'Connor's Wise Blood. This will be short enough to view fairly quickly.